Welcome to DivCasts from the University of Chicago Divinity School. For more of our podcasts and information about our terms of use, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. So I think we'll get started here because we have to be out um, I believe by 1.30, so people straggle in, no problem. Um, welcome, everyone, for uh, Craft Teaching Second Amendment Quarter. Um, this is Student Mental Health in Today's College of Teaching with Dr. Michael Pages. Um, before we get started, I just have a couple of announcements. Um, first and foremost is if you haven't signed in, please sign in. Uh, it's the only way we're able to give you Craft Teaching credit. I know I've this guest before. Um, so you can do that on the computer now or for any time. Also, please get coffee. Uh, a couple of upcoming events to let you know about. We've got um, in January 28th, Wednesday, January 28th, the much anticipated sequel to our uh, rig- Cultivating Rigorous Creativity Workshop in the fall uh, with Mark Maxwell, English teacher on the north side. Um, it was a fantastic workshop in the fall, and now we're doing Arts of Teaching follow-up, where we will actually be designing and evaluating assignments um, designed to cultivate creative as well as critical thinking. So that's Wednesday, the 28th, January 28th. Friday, February 6th, we have Designing a Religious Studies Major, um, co-hosted with Religion and Literature Club. And Thursday, February 12th, we have Quarterly Dean's uh, Dean's Seminar with Rebecca Chop, Dip School alum and former president of Swarthmore College and current chancellor of Denver University. And so that will be um, definitely on the 12th, and uh, we can accept RSVPs for lunch at any time before then. So our guest today is Dr. Michael Petrus, a clinical psychologist with the U uh, Chicago Student Counseling Service, and with a, a primary focus in psychotherapy, assessment, and consultation. His work is based in existential phenomenological model and is informed by interpersonal, constructivist, and systems theory. Additionally, his research concerns the dynamics of motivation and innovation, the intersection of technology and psychology, and social justice and multicultural issues. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Max Peters. Hello, everyone. Um, I have a lot to get through today. Before we get started, I just want to do a really brief exercise. So if if you all could kind of get yourself comfortable in the chair. Close your eyes if you, if you want, uh, and then we're going to focus on just a, a minute or two of deep breathing exercise. So just relax your body um, and take a deep breath in. And notice the exhale. Again, a deep breath in. And notice the exhale. Continue with the deep breathing, paying attention to your breath, uh, noticing in your body any places where muscles might be tense or tight, and try to loosen those up, relax. Focus on the breath in, and a deep breath out. Okay, now you can Gently bring your attention back to the room. That was 60 seconds right there. Just a little exercise, um, something that you can do very briefly. It, it, it's surprising how exercises like that can uh, sort of center you, bring your attention to the moment. It's something that teachers can do uh, on a regular basis to help focus in classes and lectures. So, um, and then there's a lot of variations on that sort of thing. Um, so what we're going to talk about today uh, is generally speaking about, we'll start getting a sense of what you guys might be concerned about in terms of mental health issues, and I'll try and address that. Um, I have a bunch of data about college mental health trends in terms of what's going on nationally from the College Mental Health Survey, and also what's going on here on campus. Talk a little bit about what's going on behind these trends, what might be contributing to that. Um, and then we'll get into some of the stuff that was in the reading that uh, Brandon shared with readings that Brandon shared with me. I'm not sure uh, if any of you guys have followed along with that, but ideas around relational teaching uh, and learning center teaching. Um, so using a lot of social psychology concepts in the classroom and interventions. 
And then if we have time, we'll, we'll get into talking about students of distress, um, students that are struggling with mental health uh, issues, how you can interact with them and uh, refer. And then hopefully at the end have some time for questions and discussion. So the first part here, you know, what are your concerns? Uh, this one just cracks me up every time. Professor Herman paused when he heard the unmistakable thread thud of another brain had imploded. Um, another one here is, that, do I get partial credit for simply having the courage to get out of bed? <laughs> um, and then this one I think is sort of relevant. It's kind of hard to read, but essentially on the left it says, what professors say is, any questions? And what students hear is, Who's fool enough to admit that they're clueless right now? <laughs> and I think that this speaks to, you know, these, these uh, comics speak to um, some of the things that are going on in education in general, but some of the kinds of things you'll be dealing with as teachers and professors. So with that being said, any questions? I mean, are, are there any areas that you guys are concerned about or wanting to learn about today that I can try and tap into as we talk? Um, it, it's been my experience that there are just a lot of students who are on medications of various kinds for depression, for anxiety. Um, so how to what to do about that? Do yeah, about that. yeah, yeah, definitely. We'll talk about that. Yeah, um, I work with first year students here at the university, and I'm finding a lot of them feel very pressured to have their major decided and have their entire life path like set first quarter. Yeah. Um, and uh, I don't know, trying to find a way to intervene and say, you can wait a little while to figure out what you want to do with your life. Yeah, yeah, I mean those cultural pressures, family pressures uh, are really present for a lot of students and something at the counseling center uh, that we deal with all the time with students. And it's hard as a professor, the kinds of, inter or, uh, you know, in, in the teaching role, what kinds of interventions and ways to interact with students. Uh, and that, that, that is gonna be a focus of how like sort of the limits of that and, and to get an understanding of what might be contributing to that to some extent. Yeah. I'm kind of thinking about boundaries um, in the sense of like, uh, so I, I, I'm working as a TA with first year college students, but mm -hmm. I'm also uh, working as a dorm parent. I'm living in the dorms as at our age. Yeah, at yeah. our age. And, um, and so, Clearly, like the emotional stuff, I'm confronting constantly and really having to deal with it in a very active way and, and um, really engage with it, at, you know, in the dorm. But but I find so I'm just trying to figure out. Um, like I haven't really faced it the same way, in, you know, with my students, classroom students, um, and I'm kind of afraid of like because I'm in the RH mode, sort of overstepping my bound. Like I'm trying to figure out what's appropriate, how to engage with them. And what what's necessary, you know, in terms of how to engage with my students that are just my students and not my residents. It's a great question. It's really complex too. Yeah. Because it depends on the students that you're dealing with, the kind of issues that they're uh, engaging with, and what you're comfortable with as well. Uh, and, and understanding the limits of your role and the kind of resources that are out there. That, that's what I. Yeah. One of the things I'll talk about is resources we have on our campus. And really encouraging, you know, whether it's here or anywhere you go really getting an understanding of what's out there and how to refer when you're feeling like this is going past what you feel comfortable dealing with. So that's, that's a really tricky question. Yeah? I, I guess, uh, I mean, I'm a student here, but um, uh, with some teaching experience in another context, but uh, I would say that a big concern is to understand how, I mean, because this is a very high pressure environment, very right? high pressure school. Yes. Um, and so how to deal with, on the one hand, we're sort of, it almost seems like there's a, a kind of contradiction that we're saying, you know, well, we need, you, know, you need to take care of the mental health, but you better do this, this, right. this, 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 this. Yeah. So how to kind of, how to address that, yeah. that tension? That's, uh, yeah, that's a, it's a really great question. It's something in our role at the Counseling Center that I think we struggle with, knowing a lot of the factors that students are coming with are more systemic and culturally related rather than but they're the one coming in with the individual issues. Yeah, um, this is kind of, I guess, incorporating both of the last two about boundaries and then what, what to do when you notice a student. I think in this case, I'm thinking of a particular experience I had with a student that I noticed was self-medicating, um, you know, showing up 
two meetings uh, to talk about their assignments, like just trash, and it would be like 10 a.m., you know. Yeah. Um, and um, also with, with the same student and another student noticing the places where they have disengaged because uh, the anxiety has overwhelmed them, where you can see the progression from maybe in the beginning um, of a term and in the middle of the term yeah. um, that the same student, um, you know, for any myriad of reasons that you don't know about, is, is uh, in free fall. Yeah. And so what to do when you see these things? But it was like, what do I say? Do I say like, um, you know, son, are you drunk? <laughs> yeah. But do you want to reschedule this meeting? You know, but he was highly functioning drunk, which is why yeah. I use the word self-medicated, yeah. which is very so anyway, I, I would love to hear um, your thoughts on how to play with boundaries, but also what to do when that when you notice something that you can foresee will be a problem for this student going yeah. forward. Yeah. Great questions, and I think the, the way that I'm going to uh, try and get at most of them is the idea behind the relational teaching piece. Uh, it, it sort of begins with a broad understanding of relationships and understanding of relationships and empathy, using empathy, uh, and then coming up with a, a bunch of different kinds of interventions in which you can interact with students in different ways that sort of set the stage for having conversations around issues like that. It's, it's hard, like if you sort of start off the quarter or the year indicating that you're sort of engaged with a student uh, in a particular kind of way, it becomes easier to have that a conversation with them than if it's sort of like, I'm going to show up and just be here for the lecture and then I'm out. You know, just how, how to sort of structure a relationship from the beginning and through different kinds of interactions and interventions to figure out what those boundaries are and what, what you can do. I, the answer to a lot of the questions is there is no answer. You know, there isn't a right way that this is what you say to every person that presents like this. And I think being able to use your creativity, your humanity in the moment to be able to respond and offer the support that you're capable of giving. And I think one thing is recognizing the limitations of sort of your, your role and your skill set, what it is you can and can't do. And there's a tendency for people in helping fields and professions to want to fix things, want to fix everything. And, um, that's not, in a lot of cases, that's not really possible, sort of helping people get resources and awareness about what they can do. So yeah, we'll, we'll, great questions. We'll try, I'll try and hit uh, a lot of those. Uh, we'll start talking about some of the trends that are going on in college mental health, which I should say largely mirror what's going on culturally in general. Um, there's a sense of, as it says, a growing crisis on campus. Um, that in the mid 90s, uh, the counseling center world in the past was sort of more this informational, uh, brief counseling, doing a lot of kind of adjustment, relationship, homesickness issues, not, not a real place for severe mental health issues. Um, and that's before my time. So I started at University of Chicago, I think in 2008. And we've been having, since that point, it's been dealing with a lot of severe psychological and psychiatric issues coming in. A uh, number of students on university and college campuses are struggling with depression, anxiety, suicidal thoughts, psychosis, uh, and all these are rising across North America. Uh, that, and that gets complicated by the fact, which many of you might know, that many sort of mental health disorders manifest themselves between the age of 18 and 24 for the first time. And that's right in the middle of stressful young adult college experience. Um, uh, adolescent suicide rates have tripled over the past 60 years, making suicide the second leading cause of death, death for this age group, which is often a pretty surprising stat for people. Um, and then sort of this piece on the bottom, the percentage of counseling center clients with severe psychological problems grew from 16% to 44%, so pretty, pretty large jump in 10 years. Huge jump, actually. Um, so th this data is from the, the American um, University Counseling Center directors. Um, so uh, increase in acuity, 78% of directors reporting increase in crisis intervention, so emergency, on-call types of reactions for students. Uh, psychiatric services, you know, 16 years ago, based on the study, 9% uh, of students were taking psychiatric medications, up to 25%. And this study was from 2011. I would bet that's even higher now. I should probably find that here. Um, 
counseling centers are in general are struggling to keep up. A lot of counseling centers have wait lists. Ours, in general, we don't have a wait list. The, the way that uh, mental health clinics typically try to manage pop these types of issues is on the one hand, either have a wait list and allow for long-term treatment or do some kind of uh, session limits. So basically limiting the amount of time students can be seen. In theory, we don't do either of those. We don't have session limits here at the University of Chicago. Um, we, do, we do operate on a short-term model because we always have students coming in and we try not to keep a waiting list. So for most students, we're trying to see them within a week or two. Uh, and usually within the week, we schedule the first appointment. Uh, but that's kind of where I think we have, a, we have a lot of resources in comparison to other schools, but even in our case, feeling consistently overwhelmed, particularly uh, at, at sort of stressful times of years. Um, uh, so what, what the acuity part does is basically make it so a lot of the non-crisis types of interventions, the, the, the crisis and acute issues become the <coughs> focus, so a lot of the other things kind of drop down in, in comparison. Um, so, it, yeah, and uh, going along with this one, the American College Health Association, a, a few years ago, it suggested that anywhere from 12 to 18 percent of college students are being treated for a mental health disorder. The last numbers I saw for our campus were at about 20, 21 percent of students are coming in um, uh, from the student population. So, yeah, it's keeping us pretty busy. This is some. Can you ask uh, a question about that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. do, do you, um, not that this is of any great consequence, but like, do you think is do you think that that difference that you're citing between like sort of average and our campus is a, is a real statistically significant? Like, are we a crazier campus? I don't think it's crazier, but I think a lot of like basically mental health issues in general are epigenetic, meaning that they there, there's obviously a biological component to what's going on, but it, it's it's cultural, it's behavioral, it's experiential, and that's part of actually what we're going to talk about in some of the other areas that that stress triggers a lot of these types of concerns. Mm -hmm. And what I'll also say is a lot of the students here, their sort of characteristics and personalities and sort of life experiences sometimes set them up for uh, a particular kind of mindset that struggles to deal with uh, failure, you know, like, and, and really, and so confronting those types of situations in a real competitive environment can sometimes activate these issues. And it's actually interesting because our, uh, we're in the process of merging with Student Health Services to be one whole service, and our director is Dr. Alex Lickerman, who is running the Resilience Project on campus. And um, he uses that data a lot to show that you know, our campus is a lot more anxious. <laughs> the sort of flip side of that is it's part of why people come here, to some extent, is the rigor and the, the competition and the stress is going to produce those type of responses. And as you see here, the sort of two number one diagnostic categories by far are anxiety and depression. Uh, other stuff on here, adjustment basically means sort of life stress, life transition issues, so, uh, sort of a, a loss of a relationship or starting a new program or a new job or something like that. Um, but other things like bipolar disorder, eating disorders, substance abuse, uh, we see some psychosis, personality disorders, and PTSD. One thing I would put on there, partly because it's my specialty, I deal with ADHD and the sort of explosion in the diagnosis and the treatment around that has been really um, uh, sort of a complex thing to try and understand because a lot of the attention problems are related to other sets of symptoms and trying to uh, sort of discern what's really going on can be a challenge. Um, so. So this is some more comparative data. This is looking at the National College Health Assess Assessment from a couple of years ago, which compared our students with sort of a national population. This is just some information about the response rate. Um, but looking at sort of, you have know, Chicago grad students, college students, then you have a combined number, and then you have the national number. So 7% um, of grad students with a psychiatric condition you know, there, there are some slight differences here, and I think there is a statistical, statistically significant difference. I don't know that it necessarily, I don't think that it necessarily means that students here are crazier in that way, you know. I don't think it's that. I think the environment itself leads to particularly stressful kinds of situations, and the social dynamics in some ways aren't as supportive as they can be. And in the systems in general, uh, I would say it's the same thing. Um, so these are just some interesting things to look at in terms of what students report on a national level and you know, comparing undergrads and college students. 
in general, so you're looking at hopelessness, uh, sadness, depression, anxiety, um, uh, cons considering suicide, suicide attempts, and self-injury. Uh, and, and what you can see across the board is to some extent our, our college students are higher than the norm. Uh, and in some areas, grad students are also higher than the norm. Um, but, but it fluctuates quite a bit. And this, this is our information about some of the uh, emergency and on-call uh, services that we've been doing, which has been steadily increasing over the past five to seven years seeing a lot more acute on-call situations. I have a question on that, actually. Is that because um, you all have been doing more work to get the word out about the availability of your services within the community, or do you actually think that that's been pretty stable and that this is rising with like, the national average? Yeah. It's, uh, it's, like most things, it's probably a combination of the two, and I think what I, what I can say anecdotally from my experience and from speaking to my colleagues is just much higher acuity. People coming in, and this will, uh, I'll get into this a little bit when we talk about what's behind these trends, but people um, that may have not started in school or started programs and in, in sort of with the symptom profile that they have, uh, whether it's because of treatment or for other reasons they've decided to come to school and try and sort of work through these kinds of issues while they're in school. So. Um, yeah, that's, that's a really good question. I'll talk about that a little more in terms of what's behind the trends. Um, so these are these are the undergrads you'll be working with. Um, the you know roughly five percent of students here are reporting a psychiatric condition. And um, this gets at some of the questions you guys are asking. So um, how do you define how do you define or how do they define psychiatric condition? So this was this was a it was a self-report measure. This was part of the National College Health uh, Assessment. And uh, it's it's one of the limitations of it is they're they're sort of face valid objective measures and you don't you don't really know how people are interpreting it. So um, yeah, I, it, it's it's actually one of the limitations that I struggle with in terms of interpreting this data in general. But uh, let's see. is it just self-reported or this is all self-reported? So this is all from the National College Health mm -hmm. Association um, and. You know, this this seems to line up. I would imagine that actually the uh, you know going back to the uh, it's a great question because going back to this previous slide, you know, seeing folks at ninety one percent reporting feeling overwhelmed, uh, sixty percent reporting overwhelming anxiety, forty almost forty two percent reporting being severely depressed, and then you know so that translates to four point nine percent of undergrads reporting having psychiatric condition. Um, so, you know, I think your question is that how these things are defined and how people make sense of them. If you talk about sort of symptoms and problems people have, I think the numbers go way up. If you, if you throw in the word a psychiatric diagnosis, the numbers go way down. Because it's exactly the question of that means I'm crazy. And how, how to respond to that, how to use language around that is important. Uh, so what's behind these trends? Um, you know, no one really, knows for sure like what, what, what exactly is causing this, but the idea being a combination of things, um, academic pressure, uh, more than 50% of students reporting that depressive symptoms worsen since starting college due to the academic sort of stress and pressure provided, um, heightened by great expectations, uh, and then I think a gap between expectations and reality. And I think that shows up with students here to some extent, uh, the big fish uh, in a little, big pond phenomenon, or how, however that's phrased, this idea of a lot of people coming into programs being the top of the top and then being really used to that kind of intensity. Um, but other things as well, you know, looking at financial burden, as you guys are probably well aware of being a student, is not, is not cheap. And financial burdens on students and on uh, families produces a tremendous amount of stress for, to, to succeed. Uh, <coughs> And I think it gets at your question, this sort of sense of investment, uh, feeling like having to have an answer, having this figured out as soon as possible, because you know, what is it that I'm doing here and I need to have a clear picture, even though um, you can sort of look at that from the outside and see that it would be a difficult thing to do for students. Um, let's see. So accessibility, I, I think this 
sort of gets at uh, one of the questions, this idea that it's sort of post-secondary education has shifted to a much more mass education model. A lot more people are going uh, to college, and but with a lot more people going, a, a lot more people that may not have been uh, in, in school or higher ed before, not sure how to deal with those experiences. Um, one is looking at sort of a generational piece, that the millennial generation is much more racially uh, and ethnically diverse in North America. Um, and, and these types of factors can lead, have risk factors in terms of social interactions, isolation, and loneliness uh, that can contribute to these concerns. Um, so yeah, lack of social report, support, increased parental pressure, uh, lack of previous mental health care, uh, and a sense of isolation. Another one is the college lifestyle in general. Uh, it can be a dramatic shift from school, from uh, high school. Um, people experimenting, trying new things, uh, and that exerts stress in different ways, whether it's related to diet, exercise, drinking, sexual behavior, that it can all have adverse effects on uh, mental health. So other things like weight gain, dangerous lifestyle choices, um, alcohol, or risk, risky sexual behaviors. Um, another one is sort of broad societal concerns, and this is, you know, this is where a lot of the anthropological research has be ha been happening. Uh, the idea of living in an age of anxiety, um, rapid evolution of technology, feeling information overload and environmental mismatch, um, issues related to a troubled and sometimes ineffective healthcare system, uh, a lot of problematic attitudes towards mental illness, uh, and then psychopharmacology and the, the rise of sort of the disease pill model, the, the biological medical model, um, I think that in particular has impacted ADHD where I work a lot, but also other disorders. Um, and then some consideration specific to college and university life. So as I said, a dramatic transition for a lot of folks. Um, shifting sort of gender and cultural roles. Uh, and then poor handling of mental health issues on college campuses. And then uh, um, I think something that one of the questions was getting at was this idea of better, more accurate treatment and diagnosis. Uh, a lot of talk has been about whether it's ADHD or autism, uh, trying to understand these explosions and diagnoses that can happen. So we're paying much more attention earlier, uh, and people are intervening earlier. Uh, and whether that's good or bad, I don't know. But in a lot of cases, it's helping folks that may not, you know, with a, let's say, a pediatric bipolar diagnosis or depression, that having successful treatment, that that, that that student may not have sort of moved on to college or graduate school, and now they're able to because treatment has been successful for them. Um, and then technology and other considerations. So this is the part that I'm, you know, kind of interested in and have been uh, trying to learn more about. Uh, in terms of working with students, you know, th roughly three out of five college first year students right now have used a computer before the age of five. Uh, internet was commonplace for first year students by the, by the time they turned uh, five years old. So growing up in the internet technology related world, it really changes our expectations of relationships development. Um, there's, there's a belief that dependence on social technology can contribute to sort of social anxiety and what uh, has been termed biological atrophy. So folks basically using technology to perform functions that they would have worked at and had to have done themselves in the past. Um, and issues related to internet addiction, problematic internet use, mobile phone use, over overuse of internet pornography, gambling, and shopping. All of these kinds of things uh, are pulls on attention uh, and cognitive ability. So, I thought, I, I showed this, I, I did this talk last year and I showed a little video that kind of gets at this idea to me. Uh, it's a sort of really clever um, piece looking at how social media and technology relates to social relationships and loneliness. So let's just show that uh, now. <coughs> social life, organized in small groups of several dozen of us. All right. A simple thought, monkeys that are known to have a 
social life organized in small groups of several dozen members. The size of each of these groups is limited. In order for them to function, all members of the group need to know each other well. The average size of the group changes from 20 to 50 members. When the number of monkeys in a group passes a certain threshold, the social order crumbles, and the group tends to split into two separate groups. A similar situation can be found amongst humans as well. The invention of language and gossip has helped us shape larger and more stable groups. Sociological research indicates that the maximum natural size of a group of humans is roughly 150 members. Most humans are just incapable of intimately knowing more than 150 people. So even today, the threshold of human organization is around the number of 150 members. Man is a social creature, and the feeling of loneliness can drive him mad. Yet the Western and modern world sanctions individuality. The individual is measured by personal achievements, such as having a career, wealth, a self-image, and consumerism. In this course of action, many people lose their social and familial connections in favor of a self-actualization ideal. As the social fabric in the Western world deepens, it is not surprising that more and more people define themselves as lonely, and thus, loneliness has become the most common ailment of the modern world. One of the possible reasons for this ailment is the online social network. In a world where time is money, in which our surroundings heavily pressure us to achieve more and more, our social life becomes tainted and more demanding than ever before. And then there's technology. Simpler, hopeful, optimistic, ever young. We become addicted to virtual romance, disguised by a social network which supplies an impressive platform that allows us to manage our social life most effectively. However, our fantasies about substitutions are starting to take a toll. We're collecting friends like stamps, not distincting quantity versus quality, and converting the deep meaning and intimacy of friendship with exchanging photos and chat conversations. By doing so, we're sacrificing conversation for mere connection, and so a paradoxical situation is created in which we claim to have many friends while actually being lonely. So what is the problem with having a conversation? Well, it takes place in real time, and you can't control what you're going to say. And that is the bottom line. Texting, email, posting, all of these things let us present the self as we want it to be. We get to edit, and that means we get to delete. Instead of building true friendships, we're obsessed with endless personal promotion, investing hours on end building our profile, pursuing the optimal order of words in our next message, choosing the pictures in which we look our best, all of which is meant to serve as a desirable image of who we are. We're expecting more from technology and less from each other. The social networks aren't just changing what we're doing, but also who we are. And that's because technology appeals to us most where we are most vulnerable. And we are vulnerable. We are alone, or we're afraid of intimacy. While the social networks offer us three gratifying fantasies. One, that we can put our attention wherever we want it to be. Two, that we will always be heard. And three, that we will never have to be alone. And that third idea, that we will never have to be alone, is central to changing our psyches. It's shaping a new way of being. The best way to describe it is, I share, therefore, I am. We use technology to define ourselves by sharing our thoughts and feelings, even as we're having them. Furthermore, we're faking experiences so we'll have something to share, so we can feel alive. We slip into thinking that always being connected is going to make us feel less alone, but we are at risk because the opposite is true. If we are not able to be alone, we're only going to know how to be lonely. So, you know, why I show this video and what I think it gets at is I sort of, we see and um, I hear this from students all the time you know, that I'm working with, you know, this, this general idea of, um, how, how relationships are changing, how sense of self is changing. Not, not everyone is sort of engaged in the technology and social media and culture in this way, but it seems to be having a pretty dramatic impact on how people are connecting with each other. Um, actually interested, I'm, I'm doing a talk my, at uh, South by Southwest this year at the Interactive Festival, uh, looking at the relationship between social media and attention disorders and how that shows up. And um, I think just in general, you know, looking at cultural factors um, and what's going on in society system systemically, how it's um, amplifying a lot of the kind of anxieties and um, concerns that have been going on with humans forever. But it, it, it sort of 
uh, in, in that talk that I'm going to be giving, looking at um, my wife is in advertising, and we're going to be talking about how advertising, social media, uh, acts, acts upon all of that. Um, so, you know, a lot of researchers are trying to understand what's going on with this phenomenon. One of the most well-known is Sherry Turkle. Uh, she did a, a, a meta-analysis looking at how this is affecting basically every area of relationships in terms of our families, friendships, co-workers, others. Um, we're finding that there's a tendency to objectify and treat others as part as part objects, uh, spare parts to protect project the protect the fragile self, uh, and then these uh, developmental ideas of an imaginary audience, you know, adolescence, basically, it's a it's a normal part of the experience and the technology um, and engaging with these forms of social media uh, sort of don't allow for the development, developmental process to take place. Um, Facebook study looking at how social uh, dissatisfaction and life dissatisfaction links with, correlates with increased social media use and also looks at the effects of anonymity being in the world um, and being able to act without while being more anonymous. Uh, and then on top of that, lots of challenges to the research. Basically, technology evolving so quickly that the sort of academic literature looking at these issues, and then by the time the research is ready to be published, it's already moved on to some other form of technology or social media. Uh, when when researchers, researchers said, to some degree, we threw our hands up and said, there's no conclusion to be drawn here. So, you know, what comes out of a lot of this is that technology both isolates people from the real world, real world and augments personal relationships, and it's more about how to engage with these types of uh, concerns and uh, not necessarily whether we're going to or not. So I think that the, like the, how this fits into the larger narrative relates to uh, the work of uh, Carol Dweck, who's a psychologist at Stanford, and she does work on what's called mindset. And it's basically a simple idea that, um, that people's mindset reflects how they uh, take in achievement and success. Um, she divides it into a, sort of a fixed-oriented mindset and a growth-oriented mindset. The fixed-oriented mindset um, have basically believed that intelligence and that people have fixed traits. Some people have it and others don't. Uh, and that the intelligence is reflected in their performance. Um, a lot of times spending their time documenting their intelligence or talent instead of developing. Uh, also believe that once talent alone creates success. Um, and this is balanced out with a, a growth-oriented mindset, where people's most basic abilities are de developed through dedication and hard work. Brains and talent are just the starting point. Uh, view a love of learning and resilience as essential for accomplishment. Uh, and basically, that the brain is believed to be malleable. Intelligence and abilities can be enhanced through hard work and practice. Um, and a lot of this comes from you know neuroscience ideas based on neuroplasticity, the idea that um, Changes in neural pathways and synapses occur based on behavior, environment, thinking, emotions. The things that are happening in the world change your brain. Um, and being able to take a more growth-oriented mindset in the moment makes people uh, much more flexible, much more resilient. You, you might be hearing these words in the culture right now, ideas around grit and persistence and resilience. That, that's the project that Dr. Lickerman is working on. Um, and, and, and Dr. Dweck talks a lot about how you know, this concept of how being smart makes you dumb. How early on in, um, in life, talented, smart individuals find themselves thinking in a much more fixed mindset, identifying with their strengths and abilities. Uh, and then that makes it sort of later on people less flexible in terms of dealing with challenges. Uh, a couple examples, they gave an example of a student who was scored in the top 10,000th 10, of the population on aptitude test, um, in, in, in that he didn't want to try things he wouldn't be successful at. So the idea that um, when things come quickly, it was a validation of his sense of self uh, and his abilities, but um, and that he was special, but when uh, any idea of a failure or not doing well was an attack on that sense of self. Whereas contrasted with someone with a more growth-oriented mindset, um, she talks about an example of a, sort of a classroom of fifth graders working on puzzles. And uh, one of the students, it, when the uh, puzzles were going well and everyone was doing well, everyone was having a good time and they're sort of laughing and enjoying it. And as soon as they started getting more difficult, 
the folks with the, the students with a fixed oriented mindset started getting very anxious and upset and worried, whereas there was a student with a growth oriented mindset who sort of pushed himself back from the table, rubbed his hands together and said, ooh, I love a challenge. So this idea of how to respond to you know, the idea of failure or a challenge and how people make sense of that, um, I, I think that factors in uh, a lot in terms of how what's going on with students here. A lot of them really, or just sort of talented, uh, successful students in general, really presenting a more fixed-oriented mindset and struggling to deal with challenges when they present themselves. So how that fits into some of the questions you guys asked at the beginning, uh, to get, you know, that, that gives some background as to what's going on and why it might be going on. Uh, and then trying to talk a little bit about what we can do about it. So this refers to the, some of the readings that Brandon had offered. Uh, the first one being from uh, looking at uh, learner-centered and relationship-centered teaching. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about that. They get into ideas around accessibility and how you can work on that in the classroom. We'll talk about campus services. And then, as I said, if we have time, we can talk a little bit about students in distress as well. Um, so in this, our, the sort of first article, the Learning Center te teaching article, um, talking about figuring out who are the learners and how do we get to know them better. Um, I, it started off with a really nice quote so, to summarize how a lot of this works, is that teaching is in most ways no different than any other human-to-human -human interaction. If we take them the time to get to know our students, respect and value them, explain why we need to engage in the learning process, and share with them the benefits of learning, and the subject matter while proving to them that we have their best interest at heart, then the learning experience is likely to be a very positive one. So, you know, just fair warning, uh, the, the article in general is uh, fairly warm and fuzzy, but I, I think the idea being that a lot of the stuff, the way you get at these kinds of concerns is, is building relationships, it's understanding the students, it's being able to communicate with them. Um, as, as you all may know, you know, research shows that the brain does not naturally separate out emotions and cognition, either anatomically, sort of neurocognitively, or perceptually in our lived experience. Yet that's often how we teach, you know, the sort of idea that people can engage intellectually, cognitively, academically, um, and not uh, try to work in and understand relationships and emotions. So th those things are very much tied together. And for me, this, this wasn't necessarily brought out in the articles as much, but I think the key to that is the idea of empathy, which is around in the culture a lot and often misunderstood. So I, I have a sh short video to talk about that. This is um, Brene Brown, who's one of the leading researchers in terms of relationships, empathy, connection, uh, and vulnerability. fuels connection, sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions where empathy is relevant and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. <laughs> Recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, I'm down. I know what it's like down here. And you're not alone. Sympathy is... It's bad, huh? Uh, no. You want a sandwich? Um, it is a choice, and it's a vulnerable choice, because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. I have it, yeah. And we do it all the time. Because you know what? Someone just shared something with us that's incredibly painful, and we're trying to silver lining it. 
I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put this little money around. So I had a miscarriage. Oh, at least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. <laughs> John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now, I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. Really nice. <laughs> um, I think the animations really make it work well too. But uh, the general idea, you know, like in terms of what I was reading this article, and in terms of doing the work that I do and the work that you do, coming coming at a place of empathy that there is no real answer for this. You know, a lot of the the like she said at the end there, um, you know, response response is rarely going to solve the problem of being able to connect being able to understand um, goes a long way towards being able to help help students in the moment develop those relationships. So these articles in general and in my clinical practice, the idea, um, it, it, you know, to put it another way, empathy is, is this when you feel when you've been there with someone, that you've, you've had that experience and sympathy is when it happened. When you're trying to understand it from the outside and you're trying to fix it, you're trying to solve it all the time. Um, that's not something that you're going to be able to do in most cases. And, and people know that, and it's being able to connect and, and sort of help them and support them through the process. I, as far as setting up relationships, my, I may have mentioned my, my, both my brother and sister are both high school teachers. And they make a point of talking with students before, after, um, around classes, being able to know who they are as people. And that, that that sort of sets up dynamics in which they're able to understand the boundaries of what's going on with the students and how to set those relationships and also um, the limitations of that as well. Um, so basically setting it up from the beginning, some of the things that the article talks about is you know recognizing the students' mindsets so when we talked about the, the growth-oriented mindset and the fixed-oriented mindset. I, I would highly suggest reading the uh, Carol Black has a book called Mindset uh, based on this topic and it's, it's not a long read but um, you might find yourself uh, identifying with some of the ideas that are, that are in there. Um, one, one thing that she presents is that it's, it's very context dependent. Um, so you may have sort of a more fixed oriented mindset in one field or discipline and then a growth oriented mindset in another. Uh, the example would be sort of fixed around math skills. It's a common one that people feel they're either good or bad at math or, or drawing, skills like that. But in reality, the things you can practice and improve on. Um, but so, you know, it, whereas someone like that might struggle in those areas, but they might have a more growth oriented mindset when it comes to relationships or playing an instrument or something like that, but being able to practice and improve. So, being able to recognize when you're seeing a fixed oriented mindset in your students and what you can do to help address that um, and help them change. So, interventions you can do in the class is, is not focusing so much on the outcomes and not so much on the results. Um, and, and praising effort, really showing, um, so if someone performs very well, being able to, rather than saying, oh, you're, you're very smart, saying you must have worked very hard on that, and being able to encourage uh, the, the effort part of it. Um, talking about the sort of neuroscience pieces as much as you can, the, the idea of neuroplasticity, that your, your brain literally grows. The neurons, the pathways, uh, through practice and lived experiences, your, your brain is growing and changing, uh, and really encouraging that with students. Um, focusing feedback on, on effort and strategy, so people not just necessarily working harder, but how to work smarter and more effectively. Um, and then encouraging the idea that um, <coughs> facing challenges uh, is, is rarely is not as much about skills and ability, but often the approach that people take and the perspective that they have. So encouraging them to take a more growth oriented mindset. Uh, Carol does a talk actually where she talks about the power of yet. Uh, schools that actually give a grade rather than giving a failing grade, giving a not yet grade. This idea of um, how to respond to uh, 
when people aren't successful and what that means for them in, in a way to encourage a more growth-oriented mindset. So the idea to help with students, and this is all based on you know, how, how you can intervene and talk with them, is uh, encouraging a lot of self-talk. So for them to notice when they're engaging more in fixed mindset activities uh, or thoughts, um, and recognizing that, that people have a choice in terms of how they're perceiving and what their mindset is in the moment. Uh, and, and then respond with more of the um, sort of ideas that are, are in a growth perspective, saying something like, I'm not sure I can do it now, but I think we can learn it more with time and effort. Uh, recognizing the most successful people have had failures along the way. Trying to put things in perspective and helping reframe uh, success and failure in that context. And then putting that into action, practicing it over time, being able to understand those ways of thinking and encouraging students to do that on a regular basis. Um, so, you know, more sort of relationship building uh, ideas, you know, coming from this approach, it really to me comes out of empathy and connection. So, you know, the idea in the article was to treat students like family, and I, I don't know that that's, you know, it might go a little too far, you know, in terms of treating them like family, like sons and daughters, like the article suggested, but, but, but bringing an empathy and bringing a care to what's going on with students so they can feel that. Um, giving students a choice in the learning process, engaging them um, in terms of what types of modalities or uh, uh, what types of activities can be done in the class. Uh, a big one, like I mentioned with my brother and sister, is talking with students one-to-one -one whenever possible, you know, as much as possible, um, before or after class, during class. A uh, few minutes of it, the reason for this is that just sort of short um, periods of time around instruction can have really sort of lasting and large uh, impacts in terms of developing relationships. And, and trusting and respecting um, that students, that they want to talk with us, they want to be engaged, uh, and, and uh, sort of caring about them both personally and educationally. Um, some ways to do this, it, you know, looking at standards in the classroom, being able to establish a safe classroom that's safe from embarrassment and threat. Um, it, it means a lot when you, students see you removing th threats and are able to feel safe. Uh, and only when they feel safe or are they willing to take the learning risks and sort of take on a more growth-oriented mindset. I should say, um, you know, being able to internally internalize a lot of these messages as well, because I think um, a, a lot of people in grad school and a lot of sort of faculty in academia, they, and I guess our culture in general uh, engages with a very fixed-oriented mindset. So um, learning about that and being able to embody that in, in the classroom. Um, so another one, another standard, strive to make the work uh, for students be of value to them. So uh, ask them in ways in which the information can be used outside the classroom, embed the content in interesting activities. Um, maybe brainstorm with them ways in which the learning could be more pleasant or uh, sort of unique or fun. Um, and then maybe sometimes sharing the, finding ways to give accountability and share the students work uh, with other audiences. Um, so yeah, I mean, some of these other pieces as well, uh, providing evidence of the student's success, allowing them to chart their success and how they're doing in, in the classroom, um, establish a pairing classroom, you, you being, using inviting languages, building community, uh, and then the use of best practices, continually keeping up on the literature, uh, consulting with colleagues, um, trying to make learning active, authentic, challenging, and meaningful. So the, 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 that came out of the sort of learner-centered, relationship-centered teaching piece. Um, the other one was an article about helping uh, with physics teaching, and I, I think the, the, one of the main ideas to pull from the beginning is that interpretation really matters a lot. Uh, any, any social interaction can be interpreted in multiple ways. How, but how a person construes a particular event then plays out over time. And what we're finding is that not necessarily that, that the reality shapes us, but the lens through which our brain views the world shapes our reality and how we're experiencing it. So if we can change that lens, not only can we change our levels of happiness and how we're experiencing uh, these types of concerns and stresses, but we can, can significantly change education outcomes. And I was talking with Brandon beforehand, actually, is that. Uh, we have a researcher here at UChicago in the Department of Psychology 
Zion Balak, who uh, wrote a book called Choke, looking at uh, using writing interventions and doing research on stereotype threat, whether it's around uh, sort of athletic and academic performance, um, having students do short five, 10 minute writing exercise, which dramatically improve their performance on writing, uh, on math and, and science testing. Um, and it's interesting, she's, um, she, so she's doing that research here, and I, I think she just published a new book on the topic, so something else to uh, might be worth exploring. I'm sorry, could you repeat the name of the book? Yeah, it's Sion uh, Balak, it's S-I-A-N, and it's, the last name is B-E-I-L-O-C-K. And she does, her original book is called Choke, and it looks at uh, sort choke. of like choke, yeah. Choke. Yeah, how people <laughs> sort of choke in um, oh, academic or athletic performance, and how to, how to help manage anxiety in those moments. Great, 20 minutes. Okay, so yeah, this is, I'm gonna get through this last part here, and then we'll have a little exercise we can do. So some of the keys to doing effective interventions around relationship focus, um, teaching, or relationship-centered teaching, uh, is to deal with specific concerns, make sure that, um, you know, being able, to, like, like we talked about at the beginning, uh, asking questions and getting a sense of what people are concerned about and being able to respond to those directly. Uh, it's important in diverse settings to not, uh, deliver, not single out certain populations or certain individuals uh, to use effective <coughs> methods, like the information writing exercise, or reading exercises, um, sh sharing sh um, sort of short uh, prompts to talk about things like social belonging, values, affirmation, um, which I'll show on the next slide sort of a, a table that gives some examples of those. Uh, try not to present them as interventions, and interventions as if you were trying to do something to the students. Uh, and then deliver it sort of briefly and casually without repetition. Um, Another sort of way to address this with accessibility is, is starting the class off right, having a pre-course survey about people's thoughts, questions, ideas, having an agenda, sort of setting up what will be happening so people know what to expect in the class, uh, a, good, a good practice of doing daily or weekly check-ins, um, using a mindfulness exercise, the one we did today was sort of brief, but um, there's, um, there was a recent study in the Chronicle of Higher Education looking at a professor who does a few minutes, basically five, 10 minutes before every class doing these exercises and the student said, um, meditation works like an eraser that rubs out the mental chatter you carry up the stairs to the class. It opens me up to where I can now give my full attention to this guy, that's the way they put it. Um, so meditation can sharpen focus, uh, involve, can involve breathing, bringing your attention to your breathing as your mind wanders, doing things like lifting, um, uh, stretching your muscles, doing reps, uh, and med meditation can strength strengthen attention. Um, so, you know, basically being a little creative, whether it's using mindfulness exercises, writing exercises. There was one I was um, I just came across as using sort of uh, what's called a Hindu squat, uh, like a, a traditional exercise to get people moving and get blood flowing, engage in class. Um, and then stuff we've already talked about, building good relationships, being a good host, be available, be a learning partner, and respect confidentiality. Um, so, you know, a lot of this, I think, flows from um, sort of who you are and how you conceptualize these things and the kinds of relationships you're able to develop with the students. Uh, this was the, what I was talking about in the last slide, some basic interventions that are helpful to address some common areas of concern. So a mindset intervention would be um, sort of a concern that a student might present. Like, when I struggle, does it mean that I can't do it? Sort of thinking that uh, not having the skills um, and being uh, sort of fixed in terms of abilities and intelligence. The, the message trying to send is uh, challenges, challenges and struggles are opportunities for the brain to grow and get smarter. And then a way to implement that would be sort of assigning uh, a, writing, a reading and writing activity in class, sort of present some of the ideas we've been talking about mindset, getting people to engage with it sort of critically. Um, and then these are some of the other ideas using sort of social, looking at social belonging, uh, values, affirmation, sort of the sense of um, the question of in school, am I more than just a member of a group that is negatively stereotyped? 
and getting people to think through these kinds of experiences. And as Brandon and I were talking, he, um, these types of interventions sort of act as stereotype threat and have pretty dramatic uh, impact on how people are performing in the classroom. So I, I thought we would just take, you know, get, get together in, in small groups a little bit and maybe talk for five, 10 minutes about how to more concretely implement some of these ideas in teaching, like what kinds of things um, you would come up with and how it might show up in some of the classes that you're doing right now. So you can split into two maybe? Or yeah, two maybe. groups is good. And we have 15 minutes before we can start. OK. okay. Yeah, so we'll take you know, five, ten minutes to talk about this, and then uh, maybe we can share as a group. You guys want to do that? You split into two. We can just split into two, maybe. Yeah. Two groups, Harris. Two groups. Two groups is fine. Okay, two groups. Two groups. Okay. Two groups. Okay. So do you have any ideas on the things that want to say something? Struck you and ideas about that kind of thing in the classroom? Well, you know, when I read the So if we're talking kind of about meta evolution all the way through, then it can be a natural introduction to introduce the idea yeah. of yeah. how they approach the subject as far as how they grow the way they design or they fix the design. Um, so I mean, I think it can be part of a larger way of here presenting ourselves as teachers. You know, and I think it's helpful for them to think about just the learning process of like how they learn. Like, a lot of I mean, everything from just the basics of the skills of like how they learn. When I went to the physics class, I mean, or rereading, or like how, how are they, how are they actually trying to learn the material, which you have invested as a teacher in the best of the person, what they were doing. So I mean, I think you know, just raising the, the learning process, the awareness about the learning process, um, can be helpful, and then that provides them the broader knowledge to reduce some of the areas that you want to add. But the other thing that really struck me too is that, um, and especially like growth versus first mindset, is to, I mean, of course, we're doing that. But um, but is being more process oriented rather than outcome oriented, and so um, you know rather than I mean that's the problem with the final paper or the you know feedback. I mean you know they, they don't get any feedback earlier on. When you're done, like emphasizing you still have a final project, final paper, but but having you know um, that project broken up and scattered into sex through the course of the, of the quarter or semester, so you're emphasizing the process, so you're getting regular feedback on your project on the long. 
And then also, you know, to kind of be maybe um, being vulnerable and sharing our dreams and responsibilities as as like sharing our works and progress. And this is how I've arrived at this point. This is where I still need to go. And this is my spawn case. So we were, you know, especially in the other level courses, I mean, what we could do now. We could share some of the work that we're working on with our other level students. Um, they can kind of see how it starts in some very rough places. And we we chase three girls and dead ends. So, so they can see, instead of just showing the top polished final project, they see how a solid project is really under. Um, they can then be the confident and say, yeah, I can do this, and there are going to be there's struggles, and those struggles are going to turn into insight, or that end. I mean, it's a whole thing. But anyway, there's some of the ideas that start from the main reading where it's doing the same stuff. I also felt like I was doing some of the things that were highlighted in physics and so forth. Oh, this is good, but kind of thing, like trying to give some kind of positive feedback before the fatigue. Through those conversations, learning But that, that, that isn't necessarily, you know, some students are doing the fatigue. That effect is in a lecture. And also, um, at least I and my friends are right yeah. uh, what I know they're always new when we're getting a compliment sandwich. Yeah. 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 Right. <laughs> it's just it just feels really harsh to be like, okay, let me right. tell you everything you is wrong anyway. with this. You know, so yeah. I have to tell you it's wrong to this, because yeah. otherwise how are you ever going to fix it? Um, <laughs> I have two sets of students. One of them wanted to use so the dictionary so as their so book. I've seen them tell us, you know, just that the dictionary can help the bravery better. They're well read and it's discouraging or all of this demonstrates in order to do this complete generalization. They have things that like this. I don't spread like it's going to be on Facebook. And of course, the writing program trains us to do this hard with a sandwich. Do you remember that? It's probably been a while since you were in the training, right? But they basically tell us that's what they do. And, um, and, uh, yeah. and um, so I was, you know, I was kind of like this last quarter of my first when I did the talk and, and, and I sort of struggled to do the, or I felt like I did more. Uh, I mean, I always tried to be sort of positive, but I, I also, you know, I, I my comments were generally, papers were generally more of these critical than I did, and it's affirming that I um, and, um, hope. So this was this is all the time to learn. It's great. And um, when I got my, I was very surprised too when I got my view that the students uniformly is considered like, supportive. Right. And, yeah, and you know that showed me like, that they don't need the students to be And so there's something you know. Um, I think I could really get I could get better at sort of focusing at, at, at being more blind to all the things. You know, college education. Uh, and I, um, what are you, you know, I've been reflecting on some of the kind of things that I like. You know, I, I think I have sort of avoided these tracks, but I have found myself saying right sometimes, right. you are a good writer, right. right. or you know, you're good with so like what you say about um, things that are very helpful, you know, like um, they're a little bit fixed, you know, right. so, um, but anyway, but but I found that, you know, yeah, yeah. the students are quite receptive yeah. to it's easy whale detention. Yeah, and I think, and I think, I mean, you were obviously similar to me, so verbally or not verbally. But there's the age It was a safe space, yeah. and that you were giving them, right. you were showing support, right. assurance, right. and the critical feedback. Right. I mean, we, that's what we do, right. because right. the critical right. feedback's how we grow. Right. Um, right. But you were so obviously smart. communicating in some right. way the space where right. assurance that you have the best interest right. in mind that can help them to see the things that And beyond just a platitude, like, oh, everything is not the way I Somehow, yeah. So, so I think we can try and bring the whole group back together. And, uh, does anybody have they want to share any of the ideas you guys came up with? I, I heard some good, good stuff you guys were talking about. I mean, I, I think a lot of it comes from is you know being aware of these kinds of things and changing the language and the way that you're interacting with students around these types of concerns and just sort of subtle pieces. I, I mean, I've heard, I heard some folks talking about how 
the sort of feedback piece and the criticism piece and providing praise can be problematic I, or, or can have you know, unintended consequences, I guess. And I think it, it's good to be aware and sort of think through these uh, aspects, but not to become overly focused and overly in your head trying to weigh out every word that you're saying all the time. Uh, and, and basically just allow these ways of thinking to sort of filter in how you're operating in the classroom and how you're communicating with students. So and any ideas you guys came up with as far as more concrete interventions? Well, not, not an intervention exactly, but one question we were raising was what, how do we respond when it becomes clear that students don't see the merit of the papers that they've just written? That, all right, this is an A paper, but I wouldn't want to read it. I don't really care. You know, this is supposed to be somehow improving me as a student, as a person, as a whatever, but yeah. it doesn't, it, the, the payoff isn't clear. And how to relate, how to relate to that anxiety. Yeah. Um, any, any ideas about how, how to actually do that? Or was it more expressing the concern that, that experience that experience? Yeah, this was a particular example um, from my experience teaching writing, and I think when I was a writing tutor before that, I had similar experiences of that. But um, losing one's own voice or feeling like one is losing one's own identity, where a student um, you know, had ideas, and I'm like, well, this is not, you know, this is not notable, this is not yeah. to getting to the content. So when they finally work really hard and they're sort of praising their hard work and they get to the place where you want them to be, then they look at their paper and they're like, well, you took out the line about the bubble gum and now it's stupid. Uh -huh. um, so for a, for a response, and I mean, this, is, this just happened in one situation, I was able to look and find um, examples of introductions that I actually enjoyed a lot, uh -huh. that I enjoyed reading, but that still fit the bill for the assignment or for what, for what they were supposed to be learning about how introductions work. Yeah. Um, and then I had these three examples and I had them read them. Um, when I was do, doing my lecture on the introduction, was aware that, that students had come to me with this issue. So it wasn't so much like um, an intervention where they were doing anything, yeah. but where I was changing my lesson plan based upon uh, the concerns. Exactly, and, and that, that's actually how I've, I, I wasn't too convinced by these sort of real formal interventions, like when do you have time to do something like this? Or when, when are students going to respond to something like this? I, I mean, in a lab, you can show that this stuff works really well, but how do you adapt it to what's going on with your students? And I think it's, it's exactly that, it's making sort of small tweaks to respond to what's going to the student right in front of you and, and, and what you know about them and what you know about the class. Uh, I, I think a big thing uh, is feedback, just in general, how to, how to provide feedback that's effective and constructive. Uh, and I think it takes work, you know, like it like was mentioned in the empathy videos, it, it takes engagement. It's just being able to comment and give feedback on the process rather than just the result. You know, one of the biggest sort of concerns I hear from students, and you probably have as well, is the idea of doing a whole quarter class and just having one paper or one test at the end that somehow sums up your worth. And that, that totally goes against the more growth-oriented mindset. So being able over the course of a quarter, over the course of a year, to encourage process, to encourage growth, uh, and to think about how providing feedback through the quarter. Any other sort of concrete or um, intervention type things? This will need to be our last, uh, oh, last element discussion. Sure. Well, um, you know, thanks, thanks for having me here. This is all a, sort of a new piece for me to talk about. I'm, uh, you, last time I was here, I spoke more about sort of mental health, how, how professors can respond to the clinical issues and acute issues, and that might be something to come, come back and talk about at some point. Um, we routinely, well, I guess I'll just show this. You know, this is a list of the services we have on our campus. So, uh, what we primarily do at the Student Counseling Center is short-term counseling for individuals, groups. We have psychiatric treatment, which is medication uh, evaluations. Um, we do crisis and interventions 24-7, 365 days a year. Um, and then lots of other services from disability services and health services. Um, a really well-resourced university, but as far as being a professor and being a teacher, is really educating yourself on what's available as far as referrals and who you can contact and when. Um, 
that, I think that gets at a lot of the questions about the boundaries and how to communicate with students. Uh, is knowing the limitations of what you're capable of doing and then how to get them to the resources that they need. Where is this list of knowing? The this, this list of resources. Oh, this, I mean, I just have this here. It's, it's on our website, too, the types of resources we have. And as I said, we're merging with student health, so uh, our website's almost the same. Ours is counseling.uchicago.edu. And has all our different resources. We do a lot of outreach and workshops and things like that, too. So, you know, wherever you end up, whether that's here or other campuses, you know, really going out and looking to find the kinds of things that your school has to offer. Let's thank Dr. Michael We thank you for listening to or viewing our podcast. For more information and for other podcasts, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. Copyright, the University of Chicago Divinity School. Thank you.